my name is Andrew Kim, and I'm the National Sales Manager for Coa American Corporation. First of all, thanks for joining me today, and uh, I'd like to talk and present about an upcoming trend in the market, which is uh, visible to SWEAR technology. I'll be focusing on the optics portion of that. Uh, but before, I'd like to briefly talk about Koa's uh, company history. So Koa is a Japanese company and founded in 1894. It's privately owned by the Miwa family. Currently, the CEO is Yoshihiro Miwa. Uh, total uh, group uh, consists of 6,500 employees. And the business is broken up into uh, two arms, the manufacturing group and training group. Uh, Co is probably most well known for the pharmaceutical division, but uh, our our division is the optics or vision systems division. And uh, fun fact, uh, Coa actually started in the textile industry as a cotton manufacturer. So Coa has over forty international business hubs around the world and growing. And um, so we, for my division, uh, we started around in the 1940s uh, under the electronics and optics division. Shortly thereafter, uh, we started manufacturing spotting scopes and binoculars, which is probably what uh, COA is most well known for in the US anyways. Uh, so COA basically has a rich optical heritage and um, this is a fun fact too, but this picture of uh, our Promenar cinema lenses and a Koa 6 camera, which were made in the 1960s. And I guess there's, they were so popular, um, maybe they're still being used in some films and uh, movies uh, even today. Uh, anyways, uh, Koa does everything in-house, uh, everything from optical mechanical design to lens manufacturing, to the engineering, to the optical testing, to assembly, to mass production, and uh, quality control. Uh, Co is most well known for in the machine vision market. Uh, so the machine vision lenses, uh, such as our wide angle low distortion lenses. And then in the CT CCTV market, uh, mostly for our long range motorized zoom lenses. Uh, maybe was not as well known obvious, for obvious reasons, but uh, we do a lot of custom uh, design and development uh, via OEM. And um, we also may manufacture and make a lot of cameras. Uh, this one specifically talking about our super low light camera for security. Um, and this is kind of summary. So we basically have over 70 years of experience with optical design and manufacturing. Uh, we specialize again in machine vision and CCTV products. Uh, we have a very wide range of off the shelf products. Uh, so that's kind of a, one of our big advantages. We can be a one stop shop for optics. Um, again, we're uh, very, very uh, have extensive uh, expertise in customized solutions. And um, for most of our products are still manufactured in Japan. Uh, so back to the main topic, uh, what is visible sphere? Uh, so I'll briefly explain um, everything you can see with the naked eye is um, falls under visible light or visible spectrum. And that's roughly 450 nanometers to 850 nanometers. Uh, below that is ultraviolet light. And uh, above that is uh, NIR or near infrared light which is about 850 to 1,000 nanometers. Um, that's pretty much like images they, or dark images you can still see in color. And um, from 1,000 to 2,000 nanometers is uh, SWEAR or shortwave infrared. Uh, and that's kind of like images you see in black, white, or gray. After that, you have mid-wave infrared and then uh, long-wave infrared, it's kind of like thermal imaging. Uh, so COA released um, this year in 2021, a new visible sphere series in, um, in anticipation of this growing trend. And we, we think uh, it'll continue to grow, especially as more um, camera manufacturers and sensor manufacturers adopt the technology. And um, over time, the cost uh, to manufacture will decrease. Uh, and, and the benefits uh, will uh, grow exponentially. 
So, but in any case, um, this lens series is one inch uh, format size. It has 12 megapixel rating and can resolve down to 3.1 microns. Uh, the big factor um, is the transmission or the high transmission from 450 nanometers to 2000 nanometer wavelength range. And then the second big factor is um, the no focus shift. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so there is an 8, 12, 16, 25, 35, and 50 millimeter model. Um, and again, the image size one inch or 16 millimeter diagonal. Uh, it has a C mount, uh, 12 megapixel, 3.1 micron, uh, very fast F 1.8 F stop, except for the 50 millimeter lens, which has an F 2.5. Uh, stop and the wavelength is uh, again visible to 2000 nanometers so just going to go over the features uh, really quick so it utilizes our uh, COAS ultra wideband multi coatings to increase the transmission and then it virtually has zero focus shift from visible to 2000 nanometers um, it utilizes special extra low dispersion or xd glass which significantly reduces chromatic aberration or otherwise known as uh, color blur or color fringing. It includes our COA, uh, COA signature floating mechanism design. That's just a, a mechanical design um, that allows the internal lens groups to move independently of each other. Anyways, it eliminates optical aberrations from close distance to infinity. Uh, has high re resolution of 12 megapixel and then can resolve down to 3.1 micron. Um, mentioned that already, so low distortion. Uh, it's suitable with sensors such as Sony's IMX990 and IMX991. Um, it's this product series is, is still made in Japan as well. Uh, so this is kind of explaining the zero focus shift, but um, the, the top one is our uh, visible sphere lens. So e even from visible to sphere, in this case, six, up to 16, 15 nanometers, or vice versa from sphere to visible, you can see the picture relatively um, the same uh, in focus. Sorry, I kind of just blew up this image, so maybe it's not as sharp as it should be, but um, the main point is just uh, the, the focus doesn't change. However, if you compare it to standard sphere lens from sphere to visible, definitely a visible, though, there is a huge focus shift and you'd um, so you'd not be able to get a clear picture. So that's the primary benefit of our visible sphere HC-VIS-SW series. Um, so uh, again, it allows the image to remain in focus even when um, link, link changes, for example, from day to night or, or night to day. Um, and then standard lenses, near IR lenses, sphere lenses, they, they will have a focus because um, um, if when the wavelength changes, it, it um, there's a difference in the refractive index, um, and then uh, you can kind of eliminate these focus shift problems by utilizing XD glass, and then I'll carefully aligning all internal lens elements. This is kind of explaining the focus shift issue. So here it, we have the lens, uh, the light optical path, uh, standard sphere lens. So even different uh, sphere wavelength. Uh, I guess light. Uh, so um, in this case, a green and then orange or red um, optical path. Uh, so it has different focal points and the difference of focal points basically cause focus shift. However, because um, in, in the case of our visible sphere lens, uh, because of what I mentioned before, XD glass and you know, perfectly aligning the lens elements, um, it allows the light path to uh, to make uh, and go into one focal point. Uh, so this is a high transmission. This is a transmission chart of the visible sphere lens. Uh, basically, anything over 80% is pretty good, but you can see uh, the transmission is pretty high and stable from, from uh, visible to 2,000 nanometers. Uh, and the next couple of slides, I'll kind of show you um, uh, tests or photo examples of um, what I've just mentioned. So we've done um, tests and um, the location was at a co facility in Tokyo, Japan. And we used basically all co lenses. Um, 
the first one is our visible sphere. Second one is our is the standard visible lens. Um, the third one is the IR corrected high transmission lens, and the fourth one is a sphere lens. They're all 25 millimeter uh, focal lengths. And the camera we use is Raptor Owl 1280. The lighting uh, we use was a visible LED light. Uh, and a sphere LED light with wavelength range from 850 nanometer to 1650 nanometers. And then uh, the Raptor Owl 1280 specs uh, it uses in gas sensor, the actual pixel 1280 by 1024, pitch is 10 by 10 microns. The spectral range is uh, 400 to 1700 nanometers. Uh, digital output is a, a 12 bit camera link. And uh, here you can see uh, basically uh, a focus shift test. And um, again, all the focal lengths we use were, were 25 millimeter lenses. Working distance is all the same at 300 millimeter and aperture at F4. So for with our visible sphere lens here from visible to 1650, you see the center MTF data sheet or data chart. Uh, focus pretty much um, remains same, pretty much sharp. Um, when you're comparing it to a near IR, uh, a IR corrected lens, meaning high transmission and uh, no focus shift until near IR, um, you can see from visible at 850 nanometer, which is near IR, um, focus pretty, pretty uh, remains uh, fine. And then when you get into the sphere range at 1650 nanometers, um, it slightly gets a little bit out of focus, but maybe still access, uh, acceptable. And uh, this is kind of just magnifying the image. Uh, so you can see uh, it visible uh, versus the sphere 50 nanometer. There is less focus shift. Um, and then the um, near IR and IR corrected lens. From visible to sphere, it's slightly, uh, you can see a slight focus shift. And then this is a standard uh, visible lens. Um, so in visible range, obviously the, the lens performs fine, but you can see the spiral lens uh, uh, range, the, the lens yeah, definitely cannot perform. Um, and here we have the opposite situation. Uh, so, in a, so this is a sphere lens. And sphere range, uh, the lens is fine, but in the uh, visible spectrum, the, the sphere lens definitely doesn't perform well. Uh, so this is kind of the focus shift. You can see the entire range uh, for the visible sphere. And again, um, pretty much at different wavelength ranges, uh, the, the, the center image remains in focus. And then here, this is the IR, um, near IR, and then IR corrected lens uh, from visible to sphere. Uh, focus slightly gets softer. This is the one inch standard uh, visible lens. And then from visible to sphere, it, it, the, it, the picture definitely gets out of focus, maybe from 940 nanometers and above. And then the sphere uh, lens is the opposite. Again, sphere spectrum is fine. Uh, one thing to note is that this, this sphere lens is not uh, sphere corrected, IR corrected, whatever you want to say, or however you want to say it. Um, so at, even at different sphere wavelength ranges, you have to readjust the focus. And then at visible, the lens is out of focus for sure. So some sample applications, there's a lot like uh, currency uh, inspection, um, sorting, uh, fruit, in, fruit inspection, um, and I'll, I'll just go over a few of them. So uh, mainly with the visible, the sphere lens, you can inspect the outer appearance and the interior appearance um, using the same lens. Um, so normally people uh, have to use a visible camera and a sphere camera. Um, this kind of eliminates the need for additional cameras, additional optics. You can kind of, um, and as the technology gets uh, better, um, you know, the cost savings will only increase. So um, here for this fruit, 
and the visible spectrum, you can see if there's any uh, visible blemishes, but definitely in the sphere spectrum, you can see for uh, bruising or any kind of um, parts that get rotten. Um, here, um, in this case, you can see the outside case. Of course, you can't see inside, but at the visible spectrum, but in the sphere spectrum, in this case, 1550 nanometers, you can see kind of the foreign objects. Uh, which are probably staples. Um, you can also use to sort materials. Um, and this, uh, this is, uh, this you can kind of determine um, liquid materials. So oil and water and visible spectrum kind of almost looks the same. But um, as you go to sphere spectrum, water actually appears as a black image. So you can tell the water from oil. And then um, from sugar and salt, um, in, in the same regard, sugar kind of turns, or um, you see as a black image when it uh, when you look at the sphere uh, spectrum, in this case, 1550 nanometers. And this is a magnification uh, at visible. There's the appearance check. And then at uh, sphere, you can um, do an interior check. Uh, and then this is like uh, using, uh, looking at uh, different wavelength ranges. Um, you can kind of see at 940 nanometers, uh, the kind of blemish or the bruising, but uh, definitely from 1200 nanometers and above in sphere range, uh, you can see the bruising in the rotten parts. Um, so for checking foreign objects and contaminants, um, here the you can check the outside appearance and then the interior, um, Check, you can see um, the staples here. And then this is kind of looking at, again, a visual at uh, different wavelengths. Um, so anything from, I'd say, 13 nanome 1300 nanometers and above, you can clearly see the, the foreign objects. Um, so another thing you can do is um, inspect chipping and cracks. So here we have um, outer package, uh, you can check. And then in the interior, you can clearly see the, the chocolate uh, bar is cracked. Um, and this is at 1450 nanometers. And then um, looking at different wavelength ranges, um, I'd say at from 940 nanometers and above, you can clearly see the crack or the chipping. Um, you can also check contents, so content inspection. Um, in this case, this is a um, toothpaste. So you can see the outer packaging and then that sphere range, you can check the interior. Then uh, this is at 1300 nanometers. Uh, at different wavelength ranges from 1200 nanometers above, you can pretty much see the inside contents. Uh, so uh, this is kind of explaining again, the first pit, um, the first, um, previous slide, but uh, sugar, again, turns, uh, you can see it as a black image uh, at the sphere range, and then um, different wavelength ranges, any, probably about 14, 15 nanometers and above so is when the sugar starts to appear more black, and then you can tell between sugar and salt. Um, and then for the liquids, um, again, in swear water appears as a black image um, at different wavelength ranges, probably from 1200 nanometers and above, you can tell the difference between water and oil. Uh, so that kind of wraps up the visible swear portion of it. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, what if you want to uh, optimize the wavelength range um, at 90% or only at a specific uh, portion like at 1900 nanometers as or 200 nanometers. Well, um, that's kind of the trade off. So, off the shelf lenses, of course, have wide mass appeal, uh, but they compromise, um, they compromise the different parameters or um, for, for different groups of people. And they're made to cover a wide range of applications and they're optimized for various working distances and wavelengths so that uh, it can satisfy a wide range of customers. Um, but if it doesn't satisfy your specifications, we can always go the semi-customized to fully customized route. Um, and then COA can handle everything from the planning to the development to mass production. 
and uh, I'll go over uh, some some examples of the modifications. And since we talked about visible sphere, uh, we can optimize the coating. So here we have a visible lens where the, the high, there's high transmission from only 400 to 850 nanometers per se. And then we have a sphere lens where the peak is at 1200 nanometers, but say you wanted it at, again, I don't know, something like 1500 nanometers, we can always optimize coatings for that. Uh, then uh, another common request is to decrease the size of a lens. So we could do that various ways, but one, removing uh, the filter hood, um, reducing the mechanical design to, um, to have less moving parts, limiting the lens uh, element groups, things like that. Another common request is to remove the thumb screws and replace with set screws or not have any screws at all. And um, of course, because if there's strong vibration or shock, you know, sometimes screws can come out over time. So here in this example, we made a two-way reversible nut to ruggedize the lens actually. And then you could further ruggedize the lenses by applying special adhesive inside uh, the lens and apply to all the lens elements. Uh, this is actually one common way that optics manufacturers use to um, make the lens ruggedized and, and um, almost all ruggedized lenses um, have this kind of feature. And um, if, if none of that, like a semi-custom solution works, then we can always explore fully customized options where we can make a design and lens from scratch. And uh, some examples include if you have like, for example, fixed working distance, or we, you need us to fix the f-stop or make a custom mount or ruggedize the lens. Um, those, now I'm gonna talk about the, the workflow for customization. And um, so the first phase is, is the investigation phase. And that's where we'll talk about the required specifications. We'll make a first optical design, uh, we'll get feedback from you on that design and then adjust the design as needed or if needed. And then we would basically then is to make uh, prototypes for you to test, which brings us to the trial manufacturing phase, which is about two to three months, depending on how, um, how, how long it takes for the customer to test and give feedback. We provide the samples, the customer tests, um, and then we adjust uh, the design uh, based on feedback or we proceed to mass production. Then mass production takes about three to four months. Most of that is actually just the uh, is the massing the parts to assemble uh, and to produce the lens. And um, they're all made in design in Japan and we use the highest quality materials uh, as possible to ensure optimum performance. And that kind of concludes my presentation for today. I, I really thank you for your time. Um, try to keep it very short and sweet. Uh, but if you have any um, optics that you need us to supply, or if you just have any questions in general about lenses, uh, please feel free to contact me. Again, my name is Andrew Camp, and uh, here is my contact information below. So uh, thank you again, and um, hopefully I can talk to you soon.